evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Holding Redlick uh, for our tonight's uh, 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 seminar on behalf of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, Queensland branch. My name is Paul Lucas. I'm the Queensland president of the AIIA, and it's wonderful to have you all here tonight. At the outset, can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the Agara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, sovereignty never ceded. Um, I, uh, before I have uh, our Vice President, Diana McCluskey, uh, introduce uh, uh, our guest speaker tonight, uh, and I should acknowledge uh, both you, Associate Professor Sarah Percy, and the wonderful book that you're going to speak to. Uh, I should also acknowledge uh, that, um, uh, that your partner, um, uh, uh, Justice, the Honourable Justice James Edelman is here tonight too, and to welcome him. Uh, uh, you know, behind every great man stands a great woman, and the great woman's in front of the great man as well. And uh, I know <laughs> from uh, having great spouses, uh, uh, yeah, enough said. Uh, so uh, the uh, that uh, you know your achievements, um, both of you, are extraordinary. Um, I will now call on Rachel Drew. Uh, who is the State Managing Partner of Holding Redlick, to welcome us, uh, uh, welcome you tonight to, uh, uh, to the premises. Uh, Holding Redlick are a wonderful sponsor um, of, um, of the AIIA. The fact that we can exist and do what we do is in no short measure to them. Uh, the fact that we can bring you this sort of calibre of people is in no short measure to them. The fact that we can continue to do it is due to Holding Redlick. So, um, so uh, Rachel, if you could say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And good evening to everyone. Holding Red Lake greatly values the relationship that we have with the AWIA. Uh, you bring uh, such a fascinating, challenging and inspiring uh, set of topics uh, to life in your uh, meetings and, and seminars. And tonight's presentation by Sarah Percy of her wonderful book is absolutely in that category, challenging, uh, inspiring. Uh, and uh, an absolutely fantastic topic for discussion uh, amongst the AIIA. So I welcome you all here, those here present in the room, those uh, attending online, welcome to Holding Red Lake, uh, and I wish you a wonderful conversation uh, with Sarah tonight. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, now over to Diana. When Diana suggested to us that um, uh, we should approach Sarah to see if she would uh, do a book launch here. We said, you little beauty. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled, but I'm not going to take uh, Diana Sunder uh, to actually have someone of this calibre in a book that it really matters. You know, there's one question, number one, why wasn't it written sooner, frankly? Uh, but over to you now, Diana. Thank you. <laughs> in fact, Paul, I think you actually wrote that in the email response to you, little beauty. So <laughs> I think that's a very good way to start the evening. So I too would like to acknowledge the Turrbal and Jagera people uh, as the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands in which we meet tonight and pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants. Sarah Percy gave me the smallest bio to say about her. And I feel I'm not doing her any justice, so I will follow the script. Because <laughs> we all want to hear more from Sarah and not from anybody else. So Sarah Percy is an Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Queensland. She's the author of this wonderful book, Forgotten Warriors, The History of Women on the Front Line. She is generally interested in unconventional military histories and also published widely on mercenaries, pirates, that was my first talk I heard you, that was very exciting, and organised crime, so quite a spread of different topics. In addition to her research and writing, Sarah is a broadcaster who makes radio documentaries, including An Object in Time, which I can highly recommend. <laughs> and Why the Cold War Still Matters, both for the ABC Radio National. So please go and get your podcast ready at the end of this, uh, this, this evening. Sarah Percy has also written uh, two other incredible books, uh, Mercenaries, The History of a Norm in International Relations, and also The Regulating the Private Security Industry. So apart from everything else, Sarah is an inspirational lecturer in our school of political science and international relations. She's my next door neighbour. <laughs> and over to you, Sarah. Very excited. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So I do have the books actually in, in the back if anybody hasn't yet gotten one who would like one. So thank you so much for having me here today. It's a really great pleasure to get to talk about the book in Queensland actually for the first time. So I've spoken about it elsewhere, but this is my, my Brisbane debut. Um, I'd like to start by telling you a story. So this is a picture of a 
very intact grave of a Viking warrior. And it was found in what's now Sweden. And when the archeologists discovered it in the late 19th century, they were incredibly excited because this was such an intact and excellent example of a warrior grave. So they duly named it. They noted the grave goods. There's a horse in there. There's lots of weapons. There's a special type of hat that they imagine that uh, Viking horse-bound fighters wore. And there's a big sword. You know, there's all the sorts of things you would normally expect of a warrior. So this was discovered in the late 19th century, about 1889. And in 1970, someone looked at the skeleton and said, this looks a bit funny. It looks like it might not be a male skeleton. But people kind of ignored it, and they kept on using this as the singular example of a Viking warrior's grave. And then in um, the early 2000s, using advanced DNA technology, some archaeologists took a closer look and discovered that, in fact, the skeleton was conclusively female. And this cued a reversal or an attempted reversal of well over 100 years of belief that this Viking grave was, in fact, a perfect example of a warrior grave, because the view was it couldn't possibly be a warrior if it was also a woman. So there were all of these questions asked. People were saying things, well, like, is it possible some bones got mixed up that, that shouldn't have been there? Or is it possible that, that she was um, actually like a housewife who just happened to have a really big sword and a war horn? <laughs> And the archaeologists treated this with the dignity that it deserved, and they're very patient, and they say no, no to all of these possibilities. So the only explanation for this is that there were, in fact, female warriors among the Vikings. None of the other explanations really hold water. And the reason why I find this story so interesting is because how many other stories are there which are like this one, where we have assumed that military history looks one way, but in fact, it looks a completely different way. And that got me thinking quite hard about something which has long puzzled me, which is in the US, they managed to produce female astronauts more than 30 years before they produced female combat soldiers. And that got me thinking as to how it could possibly be that in a modern Western democracy, which focuses on gender equality, that you could not actually just discourage women, women from a particular profession, but actively ban them from participating in the profession as late as not just the 70s, not just the 80s, not just the 90s, but as late as 2018 in the United Kingdom, actually ban women from participating in a particular profession. So um, the woman you see having her rangers tab is that Shea Haver's the first woman to pass the U.S. Army Rangers course, which was long deemed by the U.S. Army to be impossible for women, but she passed it on the same physical standards as the men. Um, the other reason why I think this subject is so interesting is to get to that answer about why you can have female astronauts 30 years before you have women in combat. You have to look back at traditional military history, and traditional military history either totally ignores or downplays women. And in fact, if you look in the index of most military history books, particularly written before the 2000s, and you look up women, this is what you're going to find. So if women are on the battlefield at all, they're deemed to be whores or prostitutes, and they're deemed to be entirely secondary to the enterprise of war fighting. Now, we also know that that's incorrect, and I'm about to explain to you some of the reasons why. So the truth is that part of the reason why I wanted to write this book was grappling with this issue of how is it that we continually banned women from this profession? What did they actually do over time? And how did we forget about it? And why does it matter that we forgot? And I think all of those questions are really important because one of the things that I came to believe very strongly as I was completing this book is the fact that excluding women from combat, legally barring women from the profession of arms is an extraordinarily potent way to signal to women that despite all the gains of the feminist movement, despite a general push to equality, in this one very significant and very important way, women were not in fact the equals of men. They were not brave enough, they were not physically strong enough, and they were not able to look after themselves on the battlefield in the way we would expect men to be able to do. So, <clears throat> Someone asked when we were chatting at the beginning whether or not these, these women are really forgotten, and I think that they have been, and I'm about to demonstrate to you, I think, some ways in which I think that forgetting is deliberate. I think uh, very specific choices were made to minimize or neglect this history because it helps perpetuate a belief that, that women are less equal than men. Um, 
So I'd like to start with the point by telling you that the battlefield of the past doesn't actually look the way that we think that it did. That unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell you that there was a secret ladies army lurking around Europe and it was huge. That's not the story I'm gonna tell you, but I am gonna tell you that there were lots and lots and lots of women on the battlefield prior to the 19th century and they were doing lots of things. They were supporting military forces, they were also fighting. They were fighting in their own right, they were commanding troops, they were fighting while dressed up as men. They were providing important and in fact essential logistics and provisioning support. So the two pictures on either side, these are women that were common in the continental European armies, particularly the French and Spanish armies called Cantinier and Vivandier, and their job was to supply essential food and drink on the battlefield. And this wasn't standing behind the battlefield, this was going on to the battlefield under fire to provide food and especially drink, uh, both alcohol for courage and water to prevent people from dying on the battlefield. And without these women, militaries couldn't have actually operated. The person in the middle is an American Civil War soldier called Albert Cashier, turned out many years afterwards, Albert fell ill and um, tried to apply for a pension for his service in the Civil War. And of course, he wasn't Albert at all. He was, in fact, Jenny Hodges, and he ran away to join the Civil War. And we actually have a very large number of women who dress as men to fight during the American Civil War on both sides of the campaign. So what I want to do is demonstrate to you that stories like this one, this is not my secret ladies or me, this is my examples of women who are actually an intrinsic part of the military history that we know. And when I wrote this book, I was saying to Paul, when I wrote this book, I wanted to tell women's history as though it were men's military history. I wanted to bring women into the story that we already know and illuminate the fact that they were there. And in doing that, I think it helps remind us that we often have the history of warfare presented where women are extraordinary victims, and that is unquestionably true. War is particularly awful for women, but women also have agency in warfare. It's not just a story of victimhood and victimization. Often these women are making 100% making their own choices about how they wish to participate and what they wish to do. So what I'm going to do today is I'll tell you a little bit. In the book, I run through this in a different way, but for purposes of the talk, because as you can see, it's, it's quite thick. So they only, Paul only said I could have 45 minutes, and Diana only said I could have 45 minutes. But I, what I'd like to do is divide up a kind of a broader, the pre-19th 19th century history, and tell you a little bit about three ways that we see women participating. First, as successful leaders, which I think most people can find quite surprising. Secondly, I'm going to tell you some stories demonstrating the degree to which women have agency, and they're not just victims of war, but they're making active choices. And finally, I'm going to give you some examples of women's bravery and physical capability on the battlefield, because this last point is really important. This is often given as the reason why women ought to be excluded from warfare, is because they're not actually deemed to be physically able to fight, or they're deemed not to be brave enough to fight. So we do actually have historical examples of female generals, and it comes as a, as a surprise sometimes to people. And again, unfortunately, there aren't as many examples of this as you might think. And that's not really surprising. It's pretty hard to become a general. Um, there are not very many of them. It's a very select group of people. So we would imagine, given how few women there were who were openly fighting, that we would see fewer female generals. But we do have fascinating examples of women generals on the battlefield. But I think one of the things that's quite shocking is where we do see it, and we see these women leading men on the battlefield, there's this remarkable tendency to dismiss what they're doing. So the three most famous examples I'm going to tell you about are John of Arc, who I'm sure you all probably know about, um, Baudica, or Bodicea, who I'm sure you all probably know about, and Jinga, who is probably one of my favorites, who maybe you don't know about. <laughs> so let's start with the ones that you do. So both Joan of Arc and Boudicca, obviously very successful generals. In the case of Joan of Arc, her generalship is largely dismissed. The people at the time, if you're English, you assume that she's a witch. And if you're French, you assume that she is given her abilities by God. She's divine. But either way, she's magic. So whatever she's doing on the battlefield is not because she's capable, it's because she's magical. But in fact, military historians have looked at Joan's campaigns and in particular some of the fighting that she did and discovered that she appears to have been quite expert in gunpowder warfare. 
which was the cutting edge technology of the day. And the surmise is that at this stage, the French army was otherwise <laughs> noblemen who were not skilled in the arts of gunpowder warfare because that involved talking to the, the gunners and the artillery men who were the ordinary people who were people like Joan. So part of her skill may have been simply that she was just a good listener and that she was working with people who were like her and was able to apply what she suggested. Baudica's success against the Romans. So there is, if you look, Baudica, when she was fighting against the Romans, torched various places, including London. And archaeologists have identified what they call the Baudican destruction horizon, which is a layer of dirt and rubble and smoke, which is so significant that you can still find it when you dig down into the soil in London. So her degree of raising of the city is still in the soil record today. Those successes for the Romans could be written off because they assumed that she was a barbarian and a representative of a barbarian people who just simply didn't know the rules and didn't know how to behave. And her ultimate defeat for them is because of the fact that she didn't know what to do and she didn't know how to behave. Now, Queen Jinga, she's on the bottom. As I said, she may be the one that people don't know about so much. She is an Angolan queen, um, or in, in what is now Angola, predominantly in the 17th century. So she rules for a period of over 40 years, and in a context which I like to say makes Game of Thrones look a bit like kindergarten. This is constant warfare, so she's fighting against her own family members often, she's fighting against other kingdoms, she's fighting against colonizers, um, in this case the Portuguese, and basically that period of her 40-year reign is a period of constant warfare, and she is at the head of her troops throughout that period of time. She was, um, her capacity to stay in power and to continue to fight these wars, she was Portugal's most feared adversary. They were desperate to get rid of her. She was incredibly skilled at playing off other people against the Portuguese. But her skill and her capacity, if she were of a different time, we would recognize her as being the extraordinary person she was. But her, her abilities in the historical record are heavily diminished by both the racial and the gender politics of the day. So she does engage in some fairly startling practices, including possibly grinding up babies into an immortality paste that she would wear into battle. And obviously the missionaries who are commenting on her say, look, she might be a general, but she also makes baby paste and therefore is not something that we should emulate or take seriously in any way. She's so notorious, she appears in the writings of the Marquis de Sade as an example of notorious sort of black widow style womanhood. So she really resonated for Europeans at the time but not in a way that said, look, she's actually a fairly extraordinary general. We also see female leadership in the conduct of siege warfare. So one of the things that I found very interesting when I wrote the book was how common siege warfare was. So they're about 10 times more common than pitched battles. And why I find this so interesting is because you don't see very many women openly fighting in pitched battles. You do see very large numbers of women fighting in sieges. And yet, military history treats one of these as a proper battle, and one of them as something which is different. But if we look at women in sieges, they are absolutely both preparing siege defenses, but fighting, chopping people's arms off as they scale the walls, pouring boiling oil on people's heads, all of that kind of stuff, but also commanding sieges. So um, very often, when noble women were in charge of a household, and there was a period of war such as the English Civil War, what would happen is the husband or the father would be away and someone would have to take command of the siege defense of the household. So this, um, this lady here is Charlotte de la Tremouille. She was the Countess of Derby. She, her husband was away. She led the longest female-led siege of the English Civil War of 18 weeks. This was not just a matter of defending the household. She also encouraged her troops to go steal a mortar piece from the attackers and was very much in command of the whole enterprise. And again, closer examination of this shows that if you were a noble woman in this period, absolutely part of being a housewife was being a military housewife. You would have to know how much flour you had, but also how much gunpowder you had, and how likely your house was to be safe and be provisioned during the war. So we see lots of examples of this in siege warfare in both Britain and in France, um, and as well as in other parts of Europe. So, the other myth that I like to dispel is this view that women could not possibly be brave enough or physically capable enough to fight. And I think what the history of the women I talk about in my book prior to the 19th century shows is that women absolutely have the physical fortitude 
to be able to fight, and they were extraordinarily brave and capable. Now, not every woman was brave and capable. Not every man who was on the battlefield is brave and capable. But there were enough historical examples, if anyone had bothered to look, that it should have been pretty obvious. So I'll tell you first about the camp followers. These are the horrors that we met in the index picture that I showed you earlier. So uh, for a significant period of time from about the 1550s onwards, militaries had very poor logistics. So they were unable to provide armies on the move with uniforms, with laundry, with food, with water, all of those things. And as a consequence, there were sort of entrepreneurs who would follow the military selling those things. And this meant militaries were huge. They were the size of small cities and they would move around. Women were absolutely integral to the movement of this and military historians call it now the campaign community that you needed men and women to run. Women were necessary for pillage. So you get a lot of soldiers' diaries where they brag about how awesome their life was at pillaging and how she would bring them lots of extra stuff because she was so women. And you can see, this is a picture of a husband and wife, and you can see all of the stuff that she's carrying. So they would often be carrying extraordinary amounts of gear to keep their family, um, to keep their family moving and to keep things going. So these women, again, it's absolutely essential to say that camp following does not mean that they were following away from the battle. It means they were on the battlefield in the thick of the fighting. We have countless examples of men operating guns and dying and women stepping in to take their place because they happen to be there. The provision of water on the battlefield is essential both to keep guns going, particularly cannon, but also to stop people from dying of dehydration, which was a significant risk if you were fighting on a hot day. So the women who are doing this stuff are doing it in the middle of the fighting. They're not somewhere behind. And if you saw them in action carrying their stuff, you would not ever think that a woman was incapable of being strong enough or brave enough to be on the battlefield because, of course, men did them more. The other example I have in the slightly gory picture on the other side is there is a secret army of women, or not so secret, and that is the female regiment of Dahomey, which is now Benin in West Africa. So the kingdom of Dahomey began to use women as an elite set of troops to guard the king in the late 18th century and then carried right through to the end of the 19th century. And when um, France was heavily engaged with the scramble of Africa, they were very keen on taking Dahomey and they fought the French Foreign Legion is doing the fighting and they're fighting against these women. So these are women who were selected as children and trained from the beginning in fighting and they are the crack troops of the kingdom of Dahomey. And all the Europeans who fight against them are like, well, the men were a bit meh, but the women, oh my God, <laughs> the women were amazing. They could do all of these things. They were terrifying. They were physically very strong and robust. And they're the vanguard troops. So when Dahomey was on the march, it would send the women in first because they were the ones who were, they were like the SAS of Dahomey, essentially. Um, unfortunately, and very sadly, towards the end of the 19th century, um, they're massively and literally outgunned by the French Foreign Legion. So you can see the, the musket that she has. They're using extremely antiquated guns, and the, the French have the most modern, uh, modern guns that you can imagine. In fact, they're still being used in World War I by the French military, and obviously um, the Dahomeans can't fight back. And the women become a curiosity. Groups of Dahomeyan women who aren't soldiers are kidnapped and they're taken all over the world to appear in the World's Fair in Chicago and um, in St. Petersburg and they're put on display as though they're members of a zoo. So it's a very sad end to what was actually quite an extraordinary story. I also wanted to illuminate when we look at this 19th century history, the degree to which women are more than simply victims of warfare. And in fact, they take an active role in making their own choices to fight. One of the things which I found both chilling and fascinating is that for a woman to be part of the campaign community, either as a camp follower or to dress up as a man in order to fight, of which we have three examples there. It was so dangerous to be a woman, particularly a low-class woman. In most European cities, you were probably safer in the military than you were outside of the military. Because in the military, you had a group of people who were going to look after you. And even if you were not in a situation like Europe of the Thirty Years' War, where being a civilian is in itself extraordinarily dangerous, you're caught up in war all the time, even if you're just on the streets of London, you're probably safer being in the military than you were not being in the military. So safety had an enormous amount of attraction. 
we do see a surprisingly large number of women who dress up as men in order to fight. I've mentioned the women of the American Civil War. Um, one of my favorite stories about that is um, there's a man who's writing these letters home to his wife, and he said, oh, you may remember this, this very handsome young soldier that, that I've been writing to you about. Well, he had a baby last <laughs> And this sort of thing is not uncommon. Again, women have been found in war graves from the American Civil War. Um, we'll never know exactly how many of these women there were, just like with that Viking warrior, because when their disguises were good, they didn't get caught. And the historical record shows that when women were uncovered, they were almost never sent away, because they'd already demonstrated that they were pretty good at fighting, and people just kept them around. So I can talk to you a lot about disguises in the question period. There are fake penises, much to the delight of my teenage children, involved in these disguises. Um, and that seems to have been an essential part of the disguise so that you could urinate standing up, for example. Also, people had to go carousing to be a convincing soldier. So we have women's accounts of being disguised and going to brothels, for example, alongside their fellows. And you would have to do things like bind your breasts and change the shape of your body. Um, it's important to note that in this period, there's also lots of boys in European armies, and this makes the act of disguise much easier, because it's much easier to pass yourself off as a boy than a full-grown man. Um, so I've told you this amazing history and this amazing story, and I think the question then becomes, what changed? How do we go from a 19th century world where women were a commonplace feature on the battlefield, and people would not have been surprised to see a woman on the battlefield. Might have been a bit surprised to see her fighting, but not surprised to see her in the vicinity of the war. How did this change? And I think a few different things changed. The first thing is that warfare changes. It becomes much more organized. It becomes literally regimented, right? Like it becomes about this machine of warfare, which is way more efficient. It's definitely not efficient to have an army the size of a city carrying everything along behind it. So as soon as militaries and states become capable of running the complex bureaucracies which are necessary to have a big modern military that can supply itself, that camp follower community begins to disappear. Also, when you start to have conscription and you have physical checks, your fake penis is probably not going to get you under, under the radar of the authorities. And I think it's no coincidence that in the 19th century, most militaries have um, mustache regulations about the size and shape of your mustache. And in fact, in the Prussian military, if you didn't have a black mustache, you had to draw one on. So this would have made it much harder for women, these sorts of rules made it much harder for women to, to sort of cross the lines. And as warfare became more organized, those women who were there in support capacities were gradually pushed away. We also have a remarkable shift in concepts of femininity, femininity and class, which I think are absolutely essential to understanding why women disappear from the world's battlefields. As soon as you have a large middle class and it's aspirational, this goes hand in hand with the development of a delicate feminine ideal. This is the angel in the house, Victorian lady with the tiny waist, fainting all the time. Now, if that's your model of femininity, it would indeed be immoral to put one of these ladies on the front line because they would not, in fact, survive. But as this ideal becomes aspirational, it becomes harder and harder for people to conceive of a different type of femininity, which did incorporate strength. And the example I always like to give about this is that we're about to find out that in, in Russia, there's a very long-standing tradition of women fighters. And part of it is because at the outbreak of World War I, Russia is still 94% serf. So 94% peasant, which means you see women dragging heavy loads, chopping the heads off chickens, doing all sorts of hard physical labor, which was much more logical for people wondering if they were capable of fighting than considering this model of femininity. So this model of femininity does not take root in Russia because there's effectively no middle class. So this femininity and class thing is very important. But so we have all of these things shifting around, but then World War I begins to present a problem. So the women have been pushed off the battlefield. They're not really there anymore. And then what we experience is states unexpectedly, because they all think the war's gonna be over by Christmas, they unexpectedly have to engage in total social mobilization. But how do you do that now that you don't have women officially or unofficially as part of your troops? How are you going to engage in total social mobilization given the fact you've been now beginning to present women as incapable of assisting in a war effort? And one of the things that I found very, very interesting when I was doing the book is that the term home front doesn't exist in English, and its French equivalent doesn't exist, and its German equivalent doesn't exist. 
until World War I. So the concept that we have a home front where women can be kept safe and a battlefront where you go and do the fighting, this is an invention of World War I. And if you think about the history of war, it's really not that surprising. I mean, during the 30 Years War, there was not a lot of distinction between a front line and a home front. But if you drew these very sharp boundaries between the front line, which was dangerous, and the home front, which was not, then you ended up in a situation where you could keep women doing military activities, but at the home front, and that wasn't combat and it wasn't dangerous, and you could leave the men to be at the front line. And this becomes very marked. We start to see it in wartime propaganda posters. We start to see it in this view of a woman writing letters to her sweetheart, all of that kind of stuff. Now, as I said, we all know famously authorities are not fully prepared for women um, to enter even in support roles. They're really lucky because in every European state, the women have done that for them. So prior to the war, this coincides nicely with the development of women's increased political activity in terms of suffrage. But there are all of these auxiliary movements which are set up by women themselves, and then they're all taken on by the authorities. So the nucleus of all the women's auxiliaries and all European armies in World War I were actually set up by the women themselves. The Russians have a particular one of their own. This is the uh, Women's Battalion of Death here on this side. And that is Emilad Pankhurst, famous suffragette, visiting Maria Bochkareva, who's the head of the Battalion of Death. The Battalion of Death was set up by the Kerensky government um, towards the end of the war, and several of its divisions saw combat. They were sort of inundated. They, they created more battalions they could possibly use, but it was so close to the end of the war that the collapse of the Kerensky government sort of led to the collapse of these regiments. We also have some rule breakers, and I, I won't, in the interest of time, won't be able to tell you about all of them. Uh, there is a fine tradition of cross-dressing or running away to join the front, which persists in the Russian military. So there are quite a few this woman uh, on here, between the two male soldiers, is a Marfa Malko who ran away to join the Russian front. We have accounts of schoolgirls dressing up as boys and speaking out and going to join and fight on the Eastern Front. But two of my favorites are the other two women. This woman on the far side here is Flora Sands. She's the daughter of an Anglo-Irish vicar, and she tries to join as an ambulance driver in one of the women's detachments. She's turned down, so she goes to Serbia and does the same thing again. And while she's there, someone discovers she can ride. And she, she says um, that, that her commanding officer seems awfully chuffed to see that she can handle a horse. And they just make her corporal in the Serbian army. And she continues as a woman corporal in the Serbian army throughout the war. And she's quite highly decorated. She's wounded. She's very famous after the war. She does a lecture tour in Australia where she sort of blows people away with the accounts of her wartime experiences. The woman in the middle is a woman called Marie Marvin, who's French. She was the first French person to cross the channel in a hot air balloon to become a pilot. And at the outbreak of war, she said to the French authorities, would you like, my, would you like me to come fly for you? And they said, no, but we'll have your plane, thanks. So she joined as a nurse instead. And while she was in the operating theater, she was operating on a pilot who was supposed to engage in a aerial assault on German lines. And they said, oh no, what will we do? We have no pilot, and she said, I'll help. So she became the first woman to fly a combat mission. She also did things like wanted to join the Tour de France before the war, was told no, cycled the entire route after the men, and most of the men didn't complete the tour that year, but she did. She subsequently, after her endeavors bombing things, um, dresses up as a man, goes to fight on the Western Front, and also ends up doing some Alpine support work um, as a woman. So she's a fairly extraordinary person. So you do still have these rule breakers later on. I think World War I, though, is incredibly important because it cements this idea that women are out of combat. It really cements these lines between home front and, and front line. And when you think about it, the way World War I gets solidified in the memory is really important because two things happen. Either the war is deeply traumatic for men, in which case, why would you subject your mother or sister or wife to those sorts of traumatic experiences? Or it's this place where the band of brothers thrives, and it's a curiously the best time in a man's life, in which case you probably don't want to admit women into that very special experience as well. So this combines to really solidify the view that women should be kept out. And in fact, through, until the outbreak of World War II, what we see is this very profound view that women can be in the military, but not at the front. But we very quickly in World War II run into the same problem, which is 
you have to figure out a way, and this is a problem that persists throughout the 20th century, if you're going to have women in your military, but you don't want them to fight, you have to figure out a way to prevent them from fighting. And that creates all kinds of interesting puzzles for people like me to examine. And the first one actually comes to this. I, I actually got interested in this project when I very first began by considering this question, which is, we would expect states fighting a war of national survival, where if they lose, things are very bad, to all mobilize strategic resources in the best way that they can, as many as possible. But they don't mobilize women in the same ways. So we have the Soviets who mobilize between 800,000 and a million women, and the Germans who basically mobilize no one, and Britain who does it in this weird halfway. So how can we explain this? We can explain this by the fact that people were more and less willing to break down the barriers that were keeping women out of combat. So I've spoken already about this strong tradition of fighting in the Russian military. At the outbreak of war, at the moment of German invasion, women rushed to the recruiting posts to sign up to join, and some of them are turned away, but about between 60 and 80,000 are just allowed to join. And this is partly because of the nature of Soviet society in the interwar period. So people are in youth groups, women and men are trained to shoot, jump out of airplanes, do all of these things. So it wasn't an outlandish prospect that they could fight. Later on in the war, they're formally mobilized, and you end up with women fighter pilots, women snipers, women tank drivers, women doing every military occupation you can think of, including, um, this woman who's one of the night witches, which is the famous Soviet bomber detachment that was all female, and they flew these terrible wooden planes and were very, but very successful. British women occupy a slightly different space, so they are formally not allowed to fight, but they sneak very close to it. Authorities are absolutely deliberate in making sure that the public will never see them as fighting. There's all kinds of discussions about how women can do these things, but we must keep morale high by not acknowledging that what these women are actually doing is fighting. So women did things like working anti-aircraft batteries. They positioned every aspect of the battery except shooting the gun. There were men in the detachment whose job it was to shoot the gun. The men, when they guarded the detachment, got guns. The women got broom handles because they weren't allowed to be armed. We have women who can fly every plane in the RAA except for one. Um, and at the height of the Battle of Britain, Nobody thinks that these women who are repositioning aircraft, the air transport auxiliary, maybe could be utilized as pilots because they could fly every, every plane. We also have the women of special operations executives. These are women who were dropped behind enemy lines, predominantly in France, and lead resistance fighters and fight themselves. So we have women who are leading bands of three or 4,000 French partisans fighting against the Germans and doing things like killing people with their bare hands. These women are not eligible for military honors at the end of the war because they weren't officially engaged in military activity. So they were only given civilian honors. German women are, do work in anti-aircraft batteries to a degree, but Hitler's goal is to prevent women from being mobilized as much as possible. So they end up doing very little. This is allowed to be preserved by the use of slave labor by the Nazis. They're, they're sort of protected from needing to mobilize women as are the Americans who are protected by distance. So in fact, more Soviet women fight in World War II than American men. The, American, actually, the Americans mobilize actually quite a small number of troops to fight World War II comparatively. And so you get fantastic comments like this when they're considering whether or not to conscript women and what women might do for the war effort. It becomes very difficult in the American case even to have women um, be given overseas postings because they don't want them to get too close to the front line. There are various efforts to get women to do more. They're mostly kept secret and they're mostly shut down before they even see the light of day. So there's an attempt to create anti-aircraft batteries, for example, following the British, but the, those are um, kept secret that they even existed until the 1950s. So after the war, we have another turning point. So we have all of these states where they've been using women extensively, we have this history, but there is a very strong urge to return to so-called normal. And what we see is all kinds of things where women's wartime service is actually actively suppressed. Women aren't allowed to talk about it or it's treated to be something than what it actually was. So for example, the Soviet women were not allowed to march in victory parades. Um, they weren't even allowed to speak of their military service. And it's only as a result of a pioneering journalist in the 80s called Svetlana Alexievich that we have some of the stories of Soviet women veterans. The overall, the overall impact in nearly every Western military is that women's numbers are restricted in the military. There's a recognition that you're going to need them 
but that you want very small numbers. They're absolutely not allowed to be armed. My favorite Australian fact is that if you wanted to be a woman in the Australian military until 1969 and you were married, you could do it if your husband said yes and you had a special talent. Um, most women are not trained in weapons use in most Western militaries until the late 1970s. So whatever you're doing in the military is very far divorced from combat. So by the 1950s, we have the combat exclusion, this formal rule that says that not just it's not, not just our practice that women don't fight, it's actually legislated. Um, it's in the German constitution, it's in various forms of legislation. This is very firmly in place, and it's sustained by the absence of expeditionary warfare on a large scale by these states. So people are not going abroad to fight very long wars, with some exceptions. Um, and it takes a long time to overturn this combat exclusion, so we're going to talk a little bit about that now. Now, I do want to recognize that in some parts of the world, nothing changed, and particularly in rebel and insurgent groups, women very often participate alongside men, and they do so with great success. There are more common in left-wing revolutionary movements, which is not really that surprising, but in general, if you're a revolutionary, you're pretty happy about overthrowing social ideas and rules about things like what women can and can't do. Um, so we see uh, women in the Tamil Tigers, very famously. We see women fighting in the various Kurdish armed groups, militias against ISIS very recently. But my one of my favorite stories, which is in the book, is this one. So during the war in Vietnam, the Ho Chi Minh Trail is a supply line that connects North and South Vietnam. It's absolutely crucial to the war. The Americans know they're going to have to disrupt it in order to win. And they keep bombing it, and they have very good intelligence as to how many men there are protecting the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And they know how many men they're killing, roughly. And they can't figure out why it's taking so long. They don't realize that there are thousands of women also defending the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And they're not actually in their intelligence estimates. And that's the reason why it's taking them so long to take the Ho Chi Minh Trail. <coughs> um, and you can see this. This map sort of shows the general spread of female combatants in insurgent and rebel movements, which is quite considerable. And I can take more questions on this at the end. So the combat exclusion in the West is very well established, but it is going to hit a roadblock. And that roadblock or that bump in the road is the feminist movement. So it's very hard to have women kind of in your military without people beginning to ask questions about why they can't take on all roles. And a few different things start to happen. The first thing that's very interesting is that in general, lawsuits, which open other professions to women, are not a particularly successful way of getting women into the profession of combat. And the feminist movement in this period is very closely tied with pacifist anti-war movement. So there's not a lot of agitation among the feminist movement for transforming women's roles in the military. They have other battles that they prefer to fight. And that partly explains why we don't see sort of a Ruth Bader Ginsburg figure pushing against women in combat. What begins to happen, though, is to keep all of these women there militaries do have to make changes. So they abandon their 2% rules, they start to allow women in more and more roles, but they still want to maintain this very sharp distinction between combat and non-combat roles. And this ends up being extremely Baroque. So I have other examples, but this is the American one. And the definition of direct combat is very hard to find, and pretty much it boils down to combat is what the American military says it is, and what the American military says it is is something that women don't do. So you get these bizarre contradictions where you get carpenters, they're combatants, but truck drivers are not combatants. Even though a woman driving a truck in a war zone is very likely to get shot at and very likely to shoot back, that's not deemed to be a combatant role. This fiction works quite well until we have actual wars, which are expeditionary, which involve large numbers of women truck drivers. This, the first example we get is the first Gulf War, where in fact, all of these things that people fear are going to happen, opponents of women in the military do happen. We have women who are taken prisoner. This is a woman called Rhonda Corner, who's a very distinguished helicopter medic. She is kidnapped by the Iraqis um, when her helicopter crashes. She's sexually assaulted. She's asked about it afterwards, and she said, by no means was that the worst thing that happened to me when I was taken prisoner. Um, I don't know why everybody gets so fixated on that. There were many more terrifying things that happened to me over my course of the course of my career than that. The Gulf War forces the Americans to open air forces to women because it's clear that women are perfectly capable. And it prompts a series of presidential commissions to inquire as to whether or not women can be in combat. 
problem with the 1992 Presidential Commission is that it's massively sexist, and it's quite astonishing reading it for 1992. They don't look at the historical record at all. Where they do look at it in the Soviet case, you get these very dismissive examples. So they say, oh, sure, the Soviets did have women, but they weren't actually very good. And I was so incensed by this that I had to find examples of Soviet women using grenades, of which there are many. And in fact, Soviet female soldiers were decorated and um, often engaging in conspicuous acts of valor using grenades. So it wasn't that they were weak at all. And this is one of these acts of deliberate forgetting that I think I started out the talk by mentioning, is that there was no chance that people were going to look at the historical record and see women fighting in it, because politically that wasn't the answer that they wanted to find. And then I think finally what happens with the combat exclusion is it's blown open by Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Women who are deployed to these conflicts, this is the famous 360 degree battlefield, there is no front line, become strategically useful to use women in combat, and so that's exactly what states begin to do. Um, the problem is when you have women who you've hired to engage with locals in a culture where you can't have men engaging with locals, so you have women do it, the difficulty is, is that they're going to end up in combat situations. And a lot of these women say, you know, I, what was I going to do? I'm not going to not shoot. You have American women receiving decorations for valor, British women receiving decorations for valor. All of this stuff is going on. Well, nominally, they're not engaged in combat. And so the, the consequence is that it really forces the military to change. Um, the women in Afghanistan who are part of what's called female engagement teams, the conservative senator gets wind that they might be engaging in combat, briefly calls the whole thing off. They're all called back to base. They have to come up with a compromise so these women can still operate. And that is to avoid being on the front line, they have to go to a rear base every single night, which takes hours. And military commanders finally say, this is crazy. This is actually strategically impossible. And this is the beginning of the end for the United States. So I will just finish off, I have lots more I could say, but I'm, I'm conscious of time, of saying that one of the reasons, one of the things that became apparent to me when I was writing this book, I started out by saying how important I actually think allowing women into combat is for the wider project of gender equality. But I also think it's very important to understand that the removal of gender equality is part of the authoritarian playbook. So we know when countries engage in democratic backsliding, when they shift into being authoritarian, the first thing they do is repeal and prevent all of those gender equality initiatives that we see happening in Western states. And Putin has done this dramatically in Russia. And in the Russian-Ukraine war, what we see is a Russian military, it's about and only about 3% women, none of whom are in combat, fighting against the Ukrainians who have between 18 and 20% of their forces are female, in combat with no difficulty whatsoever. And it's important to remember that um, allowing women to combat hopefully will preserve some of this gender equality as well by really sort of firmly breaking down these barriers and leaving them broken down in a lasting fashion. Um, so that takes me to the end of what I wanted to talk about. And not only is the book out now, there are some topics here available um, that if you would like to pick one up, you're very welcome. But I'm very happy to take some questions. So thank you very much for having me. So if you have a question, just put up your hand. Yes, Diana. <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, did you find that you could include everything that you want? No. <laughs> so How hard was it to? Really hard. Yeah. So it's a really good question. And actually, there were parts of the book when I was researching it, I thought, they might be a bit boring or I might not have a lot to say. And then what I found was there was so much material that it was a really, really hard to, to leave some of it out. So, for example, I have a chapter on rebel and insurgent women. I could have written an entire book on rebel and insurgent women. Um, but I only had one chapter because I had so much else I had to cover. So it was actually quite tricky. There was a lot more out there than I thought there was. Forgotten Warriors 2? Forgotten Warriors 2. <laughs> Even more forgotten. <laughs> yeah. So you had a map, there, the world map of showing different women in your slide. Can I have that one for a second? Just had yeah, a that one. one. Yeah. You had female combatant prevalence. India and some of the Middle Eastern countries are very high. Yeah. Have you looked at them at all in your book? 
Yeah, so I don't talk about them. I talk a little bit about the geographic spread in the book. So there are differences in the way that women combatants get used, which probably wouldn't be surprising. So for example, Islamist groups are very unlikely to incorporate women in combat, but when they do, it's always the suicide bombers. Oh gosh. So, and with that, that probably tells you quite a lot about Islamist movements and the treatment of women. Um, uh, left, as I said, left-wing groups are more likely to incorporate women in combat by a significant margin than right-wing groups. So we have Maoist guerrillas in Nepal, um, mm -hmm. all of the Latin American left-wing movements tend to use women. But then when you look at all the people like Joanna of Arc and all the mm -hmm. Indian princes who are involved in fighting, the, have you looked at them at all? Yeah, I talk about Lakshmi Bai, okay. who is, of course, the great Indian, Indian yeah. heroine. Chansi Girani, yeah. yeah. And um, so, yes, there, are, there is a much stronger tradition. And I think it, it is partly relates to the disappearance of women from these roles in Western Europe definitely is linked to, to a particular idea of femininity and, and those class ideals, I think, as well. Thank but yeah, you. so I do, talk about, I do talk about some of that in the book. Yes. Are you able to comment on the current participation in the ADS? Yes. So I am. <laughs> um, I can't remember. My mind has gone blank on the percentage, but I think the ADF's percentage of women is lower compared to other OECD nations. Um, the, the general average of women's participation across Western militaries at the moment is between 10 and 12 percent. Some countries go as high as 16. So the US and Canada are both about 16. And then you obviously have countries like Ukraine at 20. The, um, Opening of women's roles in the ADF, the opening of combat roles for women in the ADF is a side project I'm also working on in a more specific way. It's very interesting. It was a unilateral decision, as far as I can tell, made by the Minister of Defense at the time, who was sick of the repeated scandals coming out of ADFA, and just said, that's it, I've had enough. I'm going to sort you all out by opening combat roles to women. Um, I'm trying to find more evidence for that. So I think one of the things that I do talk about in the book a bit as well, and I didn't get much chance to talk about it tonight, is that I think that there are negative consequences for individual women to being in militaries. Militaries aren't, have not been safe spaces for contemporary women. There's much higher rates of sexual assault, for example, for military women than women outside the military. Also true of military men. So there clearly needs to be some dramatic cultural changes inside militaries that I think are going to take time. I spent some time looking at the analogy of firefighters, which has been historically very all male. They took a long time to create the right cultural change to allow women to be firefighters in a way that was safe for women themselves. Yeah. Um, you, uh, a number of the historical examples you gave were of women fighting in all women units. Mm. Um, uh, now it seems that female service is, you know, tends tends to be integrated. Mm. Uh, similarly, in the past, there were when racial segregation yep. operated in the military, and you know, now it's not. Would you care to comment on that and what you found? Uh, in, are there still uh, gender segregated units at all? Yeah. Um, so actually, gender segregated units aren't the norm. So in the historical stuff, so we have the the Dahomeyan warriors, and we have those particular Soviet air regiments, but actually most Soviet women's service was in gender mixed, uh, gender mixed units in World War II. The women's battalions of death were all female, but actually we probably have more mixed gender participation than not. The exception here is Israel, which is one that I didn't get a chance to talk about. It's super interesting. So everyone always says to me, oh, there are women combatants in the Israeli military. Well, Kind of no. So there were women involved in the 1948 war. They were then very firmly returned to non-combatant roles, which they have struggled to get out of, despite a successful lawsuit in 2000, which was supposed to cause the Israeli military to open combat roles to women. They've done so in a very haphazard fashion. There's been a lot of resistance to it, and the Israeli military has pushed back quite strongly. So their compromised position is that they have all female units, and Israel is very unusual among contemporary militaries of having um, a home defense branch and a forward action branch. And women aren't permitted in that forward action branch, but they are in the home defense units. And um, because of religious reasons as well, where men can't, Orthodox Jewish men can't be with women, you tend to have more all-female units. Um, 
Some of the rebel groups that we talked about before utilized all female groups, um, but mostly they were integrated. So it's interesting the experience of integration when you talk to people about it. And I said, you know, when women were discovered, they often weren't sent home. What's quite striking about the Soviet experience and actually the experience in Afghanistan as well is that things got normal. It got normal to see women doing stuff and people weren't perturbed by it. Once they saw women in the field, all of these fears about what might happen kind of kind of dissipated. Yes. Have the views by the feminist movement in different places around the world varied as to promotion of uh, women in the military? That's a really good question. Um, no, right. <laughs> I think. So fem the feminist movement is interesting because it's internationally quite consistent. Um, and there is very strong links between feminist thinking and pacifist thinking. And that's true kind of in every aspect. So I think that you may have some changing around the margins where, you know, some feminist movements are less distressed about it than others. But as a general rule, it, it has not been a priority of the feminist movement. Where you do get early adoption of women in combat, though, so... Um, Canada, the Nordic countries, Belgium, a couple of other places, open combat roles to women in the 80s. And that they're all countries that score very highly on ranks of, on indices of gender equality. And they're all places which have a legal mechanism that allow women to bring discrimination lawsuits, which then do win. So that works in those countries. There are also countries that weren't likely to fight any actual wars during the 1980s, and that probably has something to do with it as well. Judging yeah. by what you said, uh... Oh, sorry, you, you, you go. go. No, you, no, I'm all <laughs> I wanted to thank you for writing a book about empowering young women's voices, women's voices, because I, listening to you speak, felt inspired and just empowered through, through just these stories and made me think a lot about the history of women have come so far. And I wanted to ask what challenges do women face now in, in the military compared to back then? So I think... It depends on which military and it depends on which job. So one of the things I think on the positive side, what we see is where women are allowed, women are breaking down barriers within militaries that people thought were impossible, including getting through every special forces course in the American military, even getting through the Navy SEALs course, which in the Navy SEALs were very resistant to letting it happen. So we've had women get through the first phase of Navy SEAL jobs. So on the one hand, we get that, you know, you get this extraordinary Turns out if you give women a chance to do something, they can show that they're pretty good at it. And I keep thinking about this in context of the football, actually, in context of the Women's World Cup. But I think that there are still challenges. I think um, militaries are very ingrained with tradition, and a lot of that tradition is sexist, and uh, pushing against it can be very difficult. I think that somewhat worryingly, even countries that have a long tradition of women in combat, such as Canada, still actually have significant problems with rates of sexual assault in the military. So there are problems that still need to be solved, but I very much have come to the view that I don't think you can solve them until you have a fully gender equal military. And that means that things are gonna be hard for probably a while while that cultural change happens. Yeah. Might be about it for the questions. And this is maybe one more. Yeah, we have an online question. Okay, okay. good, good, good. So the question is from Alex Bistro at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And the question is, how have countries dealt with the conscription of women? Conscription is a really interesting question. So I mentioned those Nordic countries that um, where they were early adopters of women in combat. Conscription is much less common. So there are two things that are going on with that. One, lots of countries have abandoned conscription. So conscription isn't very common anymore. Um, I'm going to get my Swedens and my Norways mixed up now. One of them now conscripts women. But I can't remember which one off the top of my head. But it has been a harder battle to conscript women than it has been to allow women into combat roles. But how meaningful that is, given the, the general decline in conscription as a tool, I think is a, is a harder thing to say. Okay. I think that might be it for the questions. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect, Sarah. It's a fascinating talk, and I'm looking forward to getting home and getting stuck into my book. <laughs> we do have a lot of, also, you're a member of uh, AAA Queensland for the next 
year. So hopefully, we'll, yeah, hopefully we'll see you back soon.